My name is Jeff Carrera, uh, for those of you who have not joined me on a call or live before. And about every five or six weeks, I've been offering these hour-long meditation opportunities so that I could share with those of you who've been uh, doing my meditation practices or been doing meditation with me in one form or another, real or virtual, the opportunity to hear a little bit of my more current thinking and and also just to have an opportunity to gather together in virtual community around the practice of meditation. So today I worked out a few things that I wanted to share. I've been thinking a lot and reading a lot, particularly about the role that the mind plays and the role that the self plays, the self sense, in creating our experience of reality. And so I want to go through with you a very simple logical progression that essentially outlines my thinking for why meditation practice is important and how a meditation practice fits into a larger picture of both personal and cultural transformation, which is, it's the context that I hold for all the meditation that I teach. There's lots of different reasons to meditate, but what I'm about to outline for you is the reason that I do it and why I feel it's so significant. Uh, So to begin, the first point that I want to make is that we are all habituated to a very small range of experience. Uh, So what that means is that the experience that you're having right now, the experience of being whoever you think you are, listening to me speak through the phone and whatever visually you're seeing and whatever associations are being sparked in your mind, whatever emotions you might be feeling or ideas might be arising or everything that you're experiencing, which feels like the totality of existence, and it feels infinite because it goes on and on and on, is actually all happening within a very small range of what's possible. Uh, And in our deep spiritual experiences, whether we have them through practice or we have them spontaneously, we open up for a moment or two or a week or a month or however long, we open up to the wider experience of things. Uh, to some degree. So in those moments, we realize that our experience of reality, what we have normally considered to be all that there is, is actually only part of a much bigger picture. <clears throat> That's why spiritual experiences are so liberating, because they, liber- they liberate us from a narrow experience of reality into a much wider experience of reality. And once we have that taste, we tend to not want to go back. I want to share with you uh, a term that I I read about recently in a book by a spiritual teacher named E.J. Gold, and the term is called maze brightness. And maze brightness is a term used with laboratory rats. Uh, And I'm sure you're all aware of the kinds of scientific experiments, which I don't know if they do anymore, but they did them some decades ago, where they put laboratory rats, the little white rats, in mazes And then they timed to see how long it would take the rats to figure out where the cheese was in the maze. And and then they would switch up the maze and then they would put the rats back in and time them to see how long it took. And somehow they were trying to gauge how much intelligence the rats had. Uh, And what they found is that in a small percentage of cases, and I don't remember what the percentage was, but it was less than 10, a rat would, would... struggle through the maze several times, hunting down the cheese. But then at some point, something would happen that they call maze brightness. And the only way you can interpret it is to say that the rat realized it was in a maze. It it suddenly stopped being interested in the cheese. Its eyes widened. Its heart rate increased. And all it did from then on was try to get out of the maze. It tried to climb up the walls and get out because... It somehow had an insight that what it was experiencing as a journey to cheese was actually a trap. It was actually a maze and there was no, and, and, and there had to be a way out. And so similarly, 
when we realize that the experience we have of, of life and ourselves is a small part of a much bigger experience, we have our own version of May's brightness. And we realize that we're trapped in a very limited sense of self that we want to expand. Uh, so that's what I see as the whole point of, of the endeavor of spiritual life is to liberate ourselves from a very narrow range of experience into the wider experience that's possible. Now, one of the ways that this works is that our minds act like filters. Our minds take in information and then they shape it into the picture of reality that we experience as real. But that picture is, has been shaped, it's been filtered. Some information is allowed in, other information is not allowed in. The information that is allowed in is shaped and categorized and, and put in a certain arrangement and order so that we experience reality in a very particular way. Which is not necessarily the way it is, but it's the only way that we're able to experience it. Uh, and, and so what meditation does is it allows us to let go of the mind and to let go of the mind's filtering mechanisms and to relax so that we start to experience reality unfiltered. And the deeper you go in meditation, the more you begin to realize that you are experiencing reality in a way you never have before. And so meditation, in a sense, is like the rat trying to climb the wall to get out of the maze. Meditation is our way to climb the wall so we can get up out of the mind and see the wider reality beyond. And one of the things we realize, or one of the things that you can realize, if you've experienced some degree of freedom from your habituated experience of reality, is that the mind is a filtering mechanism, but what seems to determine what the picture is that the mind will create is the sense of self that we identify with. If I see myself in a certain way as Jeff, who has certain limitations and certain possibilities and certain things that are not possible and certain things that are possible and things I can do and things I can't do and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that sense of self is what dictates how reality shows up. Uh, at least in large part. And when we meditate, when we experience a wider reality and then realize that our sense of self, the sense of being Jeff, who is an isolated individual who was born on a certain day and will die on another day and that my entire existence happens within that time frame, that limited sense of self is creating a picture of reality that is not accurate, or at least it's not the only possible picture. And so at least for me, my experiences of meditation led me to start to be curious about the self that I thought I was and what other possibilities there might be. And then when I started to look at that in a more cultural context, I realized that the self that we think we are creates a certain picture of reality and then our actions manifest that reality in the physical world and the physical world that we create reinforces our sense of self and then from that sense of self we create more of the world it's you know you can see it's a closed loop where the sense of self creates the world, and then the world that we live in constantly reinforces the sense of self. So it's only when we experience some degree of maze brightness that we realize that the world can change in profound ways if our sense of self changes. And, and in terms of meditation, that's what I feel is the real value. Meditation is a way for us to let go of the limitations of the mind so that we can experience a wider reality. But experiencing the wider reality isn't the point. 
The point is then to understand how our self-sense is what dictates the picture of reality that we see and then to endeavor to embody a new sense of self that expands the possibility of reality. But the time we spend in meditation is not an end in itself. It's part of a larger story that's really about the emergence of a new sense of self that will expand the possibilities of reality. And if that's the context you hold for your meditation, it gives you a very different source of motivation for sitting. Many times, people are meditating in order to liberate themselves from the sense of suffocation that they might experience. And that's a good motive to meditate. But I think when you really start to see the possibilities that meditation opens up, when you really begin to see that by letting go of your current experience of reality, you put yourself in a position to expand reality in ways that were previously unimaginable. Then your inspiration to meditate and your desire to meditate increases tenfold because it isn't, it's no longer simply about freeing yourself from some discomfort, but it's about unimaginable creative potential. Uh, and so whenever I am working in meditation or teaching meditation, I feel that what I'm really teaching is how to gain access to unlimited creative potential at the level of selfhood. So with that introduction, I would like to lead us in a meditation for about 20 minutes or so, and then I will invite you uh, to ask any questions you have or to have a dialogue with me about, about your practice, about what I just spoke about. So wherever you are, if you would sit quietly and still in a way in which your spine is straight and you are alert but comfortable you don't get extra points for discomfort so please Sit quietly, and the instructions for meditation are simply to have no problem. Those are my favorite instructions. They simply ask you to be with whatever your experience happens to be without preference. you might be having the most amazing, peaceful, blissful, easeful experience imaginable. Or you may be having the most frustrating, uncomfortable, uneaseful experience. This practice is to not make a problem out of anything which means the beautiful experience and the frustrating experience 
are exactly equal. Neither is preferable to the other. So the instruction for the next few minutes is simply to allow your experience to be whatever it is without having any preference at all. And if you notice that an experience of preference arises and you start wanting your experience to be one way versus another, that experience of preference is also just an experience that you can let it be as it is. You don't have to have a preference for having no preference. Just whatever your experience is, allow it to be. So we will sit, and I may periodically offer short pieces of guidance to see us through to the other side. So please sit, practice having no problem by having no preference in relationship to whatever your experience is. When you have no preference, the elements of mind, the thoughts and the feelings are free to come and go as they please. Positive experiences come, wonderful insights emerge painful or frustrating experiences come, self-doubt or fear emerges, just let it all come and go, doing nothing to either prolong its visit or to shoo it away. No preference means you just allow the comings and going of mind to happen as they will. You don't need 
any particular experience. in order to feel okay. You are content no matter what your mind is experiencing. This is a practice of perfect contentment. It takes tremendous courage to be content. There is so much momentum behind the belief that we can only be content under certain conditions. And then we spend so much energy consciously and unconsciously trying to create and maintain our condition for contentment. In meditation, we let go of all of our conditions and allow ourselves to simply be content with exactly the way things are, no matter how they are.
the only reason we ever feel discontent is because we're holding on to an image of the way things should be that doesn't match with the way things are. The gap between the way we imagine things should be and the way they are is the source of our fundamental existential tension. Do you, in this moment, have the courage to be content with the way things are? We may fear that if we become too content with the way things are, that we won't be motivated to make things better. That fear arises from a sense of self that only recognizes discontent as the driver of action. When we become perfectly content with the way things are, a new driver for action emerges. Being content, we are no longer driven by discontent. and we begin to become driven by possibility. What kind of self do we need to become 
so that possibility becomes the driver of our actions. Thank you very much. Uh, that will end the meditation. And now what I would like to do is open up the remainder of this call to your questions. I'm interested in making a distinction between just watching the content, <coughs> sorry, being content with whatever is happening, whatever I am experiencing, and being lost in that train of thought that I might be experiencing, I'm assuming that you're wanting us to note that we are experiencing, that there is an experiencer, and that that experiencer is letting all the experiences be acceptable to it. Now, it, of course, is the domain of a lot more discussion, but I, I hope that I did have that correct. I, I actually think you might have had it wrong. But this is the okay. this is the perfect way to learn. I mean, there are meditation practices that are as you describe, where you maintain a sense of being the experiencer who is noting the experiences that they're having. Um, I want you. I'm asking you to do something different, which is to simply be content with whatever happens, and what you will find is that sometimes you're just having an experience of a thought or a feeling. Maybe you're having an experience of no mind whatsoever. Uh, and, then some, and then there's moments where you become aware that you're having an experience. And typically in many meditations, what happens is when we, you know, we feel that we got quote unquote lost in thought or lost in a feeling when we cease to maintain awareness of being a person who's meditating. And, and then when we remember that we're meditating, uh, you know, we, we have this little shock of, oh, I forgot, I, I was lost in thought. And then we scramble <clears throat> to get unlost, which means to sort of plant ourselves more firmly in the awareness of being an experience or having an experience. I'm actually wanting you to let go of all of that uh, because my feeling is that if you're maintaining that sense of being an experiencer, that, that actually is a very subtle way of holding on to your current self-concept. And my experience has been that if you allow yourself to let even that go, which means you really can't do this meditation wrong, but if you are able to really let go of all those mechanisms of trying to maintain some awareness of yourself as an experience or having an experience, and you just allow everything to unfold, it's scary because you don't, there's no anchor. You don't know where you are in it all. But it starts to open up into possibilities that you can't get to if you keep yourself anchored in some idea of being an experience or having an experience. I'm, I'm giving you the freedom to be completely untethered. 
That makes a lot of sense to me. It's a change from my method of meditating, um, which I have benefited quite a bit from, but I'm open to your ideas. What is the difference between meditating and daydreaming? Um, That's a really good question. Meditating Uh, this way. Right. In the end, in the end, there's there's probably no difference at all. Um, in, in the end, if you really allow yourself to go in this direction, you will come to the awareness that meditation is what's always happening and always has been happening. Yes. Right? What's, what's tricky, of course, is <clears throat> that kind of realization, and this is something I probably need to think more about, but that kind of realization... If you just hand it to someone and they say, oh, well, since meditation is what's happening all the time, I might as well not do anything. That's not the same as awakening to meditation. That's, that's just not bothering because, you know, some, it's like not going to a movie because someone told you what, how it ends. Uh, but not going to the movie because you know how it ends isn't the same as actually experiencing the movie and and experiencing the ending. Uh, and so the meditation practice that you've done, I'm sure has been a very important part of your journey uh, and has brought you to where you are. And it's possible that this meditation will simply be a continuation of where you've already been and will take you to uh, to the end of the movie. <clears throat> How does that sound? Well, it's delicious in a way because my mind is completely flaccid in the face of it. You're right. <laughs> I, I, I want I you... I can't get it at all, which, that... is, which I'm assuming is what you're interested in. I'm, I'm very interested very in Very interested that. in... I, I'm interested in your mind... I'm interested in your mind being becoming completely flaccid... Uh, so that you can discover yourself. Yeah. That's beautiful. I will follow along with you. That's great. Thank you so much. Hi, Jeff. So, I could probably do a lot better with uh, having no preference Mm -hmm. uh, as I meditate, and as I have been meditating for um, some years now, um, uh, if I didn't have the constant uh, images from you and other people that these um, amazing realms of possibility open up, because my meditation remains very pedestrian, you know, mind is planning or figuring things out or thinking about things or, you know, And I think I've gotten a little bit better at just letting that happen Mm -hmm. without making a problem of it. But there's always this niggling thought, um, I'm not going anywhere here. I'm not having any great sense of possibility. I'm not having mystical experiences. I'm not having (laughs) deep insights of the nature of reality. So... um, my question was, where, where, <laughs> what do you suggest that we who are fairly beginning in meditation, even if we've been doing it for several years, um, what do we do with all of the, uh, the wonders that you who are more advanced report to us as possible by way of having no preference? Mm-hmm. Because, of course, I like those other experiences. Mm-hmm. So, so here's what's... what's I mean, there's a few different ways I could answer that. It's a great question. Um, The truth is, those, you know, there's a a real sort of ironic paradox here because Mm -hmm. those experiences of opening occur at exactly the moment when you no longer care about having them.
you know, so that's the that's the tongue twister that you're in the middle of, uh, and those the openings that that so many people have described occur exactly at the moment when you no longer care about having them. Which means, of course, you can't try to not care about having them. Right. Because then you'd be wanting them. That would be your motive. You know, see, the thing is, you, <clears throat> the trick of this meditation is where it's motivated from. And if it's motivated from the place where you want to get something, you won't gain access to what's possible. And, yes. and and so your question is, well, how do I get to the place where I can be motivated by something else? So what I want to suggest to you is that you think about meditation a little bit differently. Rather than thinking about it as sort of a tool to get somewhere, think of it as just an opportunity to burn karma which means you know we all have a certain habit of wanting to get somewhere or wanting something for ourselves we can't just sort of jump over that because if we try to jump over it the part of us that will be trying will be also wanting something for itself which will be to jump over all that so all you can do is sit in you know what you're describing as a mundane experience and be perfectly content with exactly the way it is because you are you know that's just you living through the karma that you need to live through in order for the unfolding to occur and to be completely content to sit there. I know there was a time in my meditation practice where I realized I couldn't actually make my process of awakening happen any faster than it was going to happen. That it actually, I could slow it down by not participating, but I couldn't speed it up. I could sit in meditation and whatever needed to happen would happen in exactly the order that it needed to happen. And if I needed to be in a mundane experience for six months or a year or 10 years, that's what was going to happen. And I could try to make my experience other than it is, but it wasn't going to work. Uh, but what you find is when you really let go and surrender into allowing the process to be whatever it's going to be, something shifts. It doesn't speed the process up. I'm still in the middle of my process, just like you're in the middle of yours. But you can get a very different relationship to being in the process. You stop defining being in the process as the meantime that you have to live through in order to get to the real thing later. And you realize that this is really it. This, me, and my struggles, and my frustrations, and my victories, and, and my efforts is the whole point. I can be perfectly content being here, part of this universe, part of the human race, part of the awakening edge of what's coming and without anything changing at all in your experience you suddenly become aware of tremendous possibility and the immensity of the story that you're already participating in and I will bet that you've had experiences like that already to some extent uh, and as you relax more, you'll begin to see that you're having more and more of those experiences and you have had more of those experiences than you've really acknowledged. Well, I hope that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it is true. You just, it, it's true. Yeah. It takes, it, you do have to, you do have to take a risk though. You do have to give up control of the process and, and there's no way for me to make that easy for you. You know, you, 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 you have to come to the place oh. <laughs> it, it, that you have to come to the place. Somewhat. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say that you have to Somewhat come. Somewhat or came out of it is that you're you're actually making it harder. Yes. Because what because 
you know, by painting the picture that you just painted, for instance, mm-hmm. of what's possible, right? Uh, that you know ignites and triggers desire in me. And by the way, it's not personal desire because sure, um, because what really got me meditating was exactly what you said at the beginning of the call. I never. I never could meditate as long as it was just for me. Absolutely. When I got introduced to the idea of meditating for the good of the whole. That was a deep enough motivation. Absolutely. But there is this image. Is Am I doing it well enough or right enough, uh, intensely enough, enough time, you know, right. to, to, do, to, to be serving the whole with it? Mm-hmm. But, but that... That's the deeper question. Yes, but but that habit of critical self-judgment is not arising because I'm telling you about an ex- some possibility. Uh, it, it, I wouldn't be helping you if I just said, "Well, nothing's really going to happen. There's no, there's no possible." I mean, that's not going to help either. The, the critical self-judgment is a habit of you constantly feeling that what you're doing is not enough, and. Right. The only way for you to get over that is to get over it. Um, and anything anybody tells you is going to get consumed by the habit of critical self-judgment. Uh, or it'll get turned into you know, critical judgment of others, because that's usually the way that mechanism works. Uh, so, I mean, what I really want to encourage you to do is to take a huge risk and be easy on yourself. And assume that you're doing it right and just keep going. Re- replace the assumption that you're not doing it right with the assumption that you are doing it right. You know, do it for six months and see what happens. You know, if you could go on a... T- oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not so much an assumption as a worry. <laughs> right. Kind of a worry. Well, give up the worry. Go on, go, on a, yeah. go on a strict diet of no worry about whether you're doing this right or not. Just for six months. And I guarantee you, if you can really do that, something, I, I don't even know what conversation we'll be having in six months. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Bye now. Um, I wrote mind down with a question mark and mm. about the tangle of it and how to detangle it. And it seems like listening to you talk, um, there's a lot that can be said for your words that have, that like come, I think, from your mind that help detangle the mind, like it can be used as a tool. Right. The mind for the mind. Mm hmm. To that effect. But, right. uh, yeah. Well, I mean, th- I was thinking about that in terms of contentment and the control. Mm hmm. You are and not an issue, but that control is something I sort of. Well, I want it, but I don't really want it. Right. It seems like, I don't know, if, if you have something to say to me, that would be great, because I'm not really sure what... I, I do have something to say. <laughs> um, I, I want to say something about the tangling of the mind. Um, because I think it might be more useful to think, not, not think to think of the mind as tangled, as much as to realize that you are tangled in the mind. The tangle is between you and the mind, not the mind. And when you untangle yourself from the mind, then, as you say, the mind becomes such a powerful tool for awakening, for living, for navigating the world. Uh, But as long as, as you and your identity are all tangled up in the mind and its function and its processes, it's a confusing picture that uh, doesn't allow us to have full access to the capacities uh, of mind that we have. So that's the piece of advice I'd want to give you, you know, based on what you were, what you were just saying. Yeah. So like um, wanting to have, as we said, as you said earlier, about a flaccid mind, mm-hmm. or just like letting it go, um, Make space. Yeah. Because I guess you were all, you're always coming back, but right. And and given the way that you and I are speaking now, I would say what we want to have is 
a flaccid relationship with the mind. You know, we we want to hold the mind with a very loose hand. Um, you know, we usually have this sort of iron grip on the mind, so tight that we can't tell the difference between the mind and us. I don't know if you've ever golfed. I, I have, but not very well. But the only piece of advice that really helped me was uh, they said, hold the golf club, because I was holding it like a baseball bat really tightly. And they said, no, hold it as tightly as you would hold an open tube of toothpaste, uh, which is obviously very lightly. And then my golfing improved tremendously. And, and the same thing is true of the mind. You know, when we realize how tightly we're holding on to it, we, it's not that we want to, you know, we may have experiences of letting it go completely, but you can't really live in that experience. But there's a possibility of holding the mind loosely so that we're always aware of of the distinction between the mind and ourselves and we don't get all tangled up in it. So I would I would say contemplate what it means to hold the mind loosely. So is it is it the mind holding the mind or who is like is Ah, it? that's a very interesting question. Holding the mind. I, I want to say right now that it's you holding the mind, but I'm going to leave what you is a big question mark because we don't have nearly enough time to figure it out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have come to the end of the hour and we have lots of hands up, so I'm sorry I wasn't able to get to everyone. But as I said, I'll be offering these calls with more frequency. And so there'll be other opportunities. And I thank you all very much for joining.